Take it away when you're ready. Cool. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> so yeah, my name's Jack Taranto. I'm a front-end developer at Previous Next. I've just uh, clocked over 10 years working for Previous Next. Thanks, Owen, for the bottle of scotch. <laughs> so he must be doing something right. Um, so yeah, thanks heaps for coming. This is uh, building your design system. So I wanted to give this a bit of a personal touch at the start and give you guys a bit of background about me. These are my two kids, Sophia and Zuzanna. Um, that's them eating strawberries. They like strawberries. They eat strawberries <laughs> quite a lot. Um, we live here. This is a little, tiny little town called Talong. I think there's like 800 people that live there um, or less even. It's in the Southern Highlands in New South Wales. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's super beautiful, picturesque little place we've got. Um, that's my office there. Um, we got snow a couple of months ago. It's super dry at the moment, but you know, that's it. So yeah, first a little bit of history. Um, at PNX, we've been using style guides for probably the last six years or so. Um, so Drupal theming has a long time reputation for being tricky and frustrating. Style guide driven development allowed us to abstract the bulk of our front end workflow out into a completely separate stack. So that was a true revelation when we started out doing that. It allowed us to bring on front-end devs that aren't Drupal developers without throwing them in the deep end that's Drupal theming. So once a style guide is built for a project, it then goes on to become a documentation resource for a client. It also allows back-end developers to continue building out a site with a library of components. For every major site we've launched in, in that past time, um, there's been a complete style guide to accompany it. So at what point does a style guide become a design system? It's important to see the style guide as a development tool. It includes front-end code with some limited documentation on how to use that code. A design system is the next stage. It's the evolution of a style guide. I see it as our development practices cementing into something far more tangible. It's a source of truth. Um, and it encompasses everything digital an organization might want to produce. It's more than a development tool. Both a design system and a style guide are at their core a documentation resource for a set of components, but a design system is designed from the ground up. It's not necessarily something built with standard tools. To be successful, it needs to be treated as a project in its own right. So um, like a style guide, it's going to include a list of components. Um, maybe less like a style guide, it's going to include detailed guidelines and instructions on how to use those components from a development perspective, but additionally from a design perspective. It's going to include organization-wide preferences like color, typography, and white space with detailed instructions on how they should be used. Um, at its core, it's just a website, though. So um, let's take a quick look at some examples. And um, if you're interested in design systems, definitely check out Rich's talk, which is next up, I think. So yeah, Brexit's proving pretty tough for the UK to crack at the moment. But they've been, um, this design system's been the poster child for a long time. This is the AUGov um, design system. It's really matured, and they're using a lot of the tools we'll be looking at in a minute. Atlassian, and yeah, Google Material Design. It's been around for a while. I think we're still waiting for Google to adopt it. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the core principle of a design system. Um, the goal is to get visual designers, content designers, uh, developers, scrum masters, CEOs, and ministers all on the same page. Done successfully, it will establish this language in a long-lasting form um, that can be used by everyone in your organization. So what goes into one? A lot of work, firstly. Um, it's not something that comes together in a few sprints. It's going to take a lot of consultation. Um, it's going to take one or a few designers some time to create and design and test the work. 
Um, then you'll need some front end, some savvy front end developers to put that code, um, put it into code in a way that's clear and makes sense for uh, less front end savvy developers to use. But uh, purely from a practical perspective, what should it encompass? So colors, they're pretty important. Um, where a design system would differ from a style guide is the reasoning of each color's explained. Um, yeah, there should be context around the how and why. Typography words, they're important too. So um, again, we've got uh, context around type. Why is it being used? How do you use it? Spacing and white space, having to find rules and reasoning um, behind spacing makes so many common problems go away. So the intersection of components is just as important as the components themselves. Branding logo is probably important. Um, these would apply for an organization specific design system. Then we have the components. Um, it's a pretty ambiguous term. We'd call a component any UI element. Um, you should include any component that's gonna get used more than once. If you're building something that's totally unique or specific, um, then maybe it shouldn't end up in the design system. So layout, um, a grid system, this is really important, fully fleshed out, they're pretty useful. Um, I find them particularly fun to build as well, it helps satisfy my OCD syndrome. <laughs> so yeah, what shouldn't it include? I think that comes down to the scope of what your organization does. Um, I'd say at a common level, um, any one-off items that are unlikely to be reused um, can be spun off into their own code bases. Um, yeah, ask yourself the question, is this useful for someone else? Um, does this help communicate something that's important? Um, if the answer is yes, then bring it in and document it. So a design system is a product and it should be treated like one. It should have a backlog, it needs a multidiscipline team, um, UX designers, visual designers, developers. Um, it's gonna need a significant investment to pull off in a polished fashion. But the value of a design system can't really be overstated. Um, the amount of time, effort and confusion you'll save is pretty impossible to quantify. Um, particularly for large organizations. So yeah, I'll say first, there's no right or wrong way. Um, instead, there's a few pieces of the puzzle you wanna make sure you've got covered. Um, so let's come back to the idea of a design system as a communication tool. Um, what exactly are we trying to communicate? So there's three things primarily. Uh, the design itself. Um, visually, what things look like, and we looked at some um, design examples earlier. Then we have the code, the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, the React, and everything else. And yeah, the, probably the most important piece, the documentation, the guidelines, the instructions on how to use the contents of the design system. So yeah, add these three up, and ideally you get a website. That's the finished product, essentially. Um, but basically, we, we want a website to contain all the info we've talked about. So yeah, how do we build a website for a design system? Um, we'll just take a quick look at some of the tooling. PNX standardized on KSS Node quite a while ago. Um, basically, every style guide or design system we've built uses uh, KSS Node. So what's so good about it? Um, Documentation for code and components is written inside uh, CSS using a really simple syntax. Um, this is great for developers both writing and reading the documentation. Um, there's Drupal integration built right in and using Twig and KSS means you can have the uh, exact same templates driving your design system and a Drupal site. It's super customizable. You can roll your own templates and customize um, everything that goes into it. Uh, a couple of cons, it's pretty rigid structure-wise. So there's one template file which drives the whole website. Um, it works best for, si for a simple document structure. I think the, like the complex design systems we looked at before, before wouldn't have been built with KSS. So all, all the content lives in code. Um, so that makes it very difficult to content manage 
Um, unless you understand code, you can't really contribute to the documentation. And yeah, you probably wouldn't use the out-of-the-box themes. Um, so you'll have to factor in additional effort to build one from scratch. So uh, Storybook has emerged as a really solid replacement for KSS Node. Um, it's, it's way more modern in its tooling. Um, it's got a lot of really powerful features built in. Um, things like viewport sizing, col color contrast, um, accessibility checking, grid overlays. Uh, it's got a docs plugin which gives you documentation written in Markdown, which makes it easier to content manage and contribute to. Um, yeah, the docs pages look great. They're interactive, customizable. And yeah, there, there are plugins basically for every front end technology in use, so you can really use anything with it. Um, and yeah, on the other hand, its layout and design is really set in stone. Um, you can theme it to a degree, but I think what you're looking at with Storybook is a defined tool. It's not uh, really like a customized experience. Um, one Storybook site is going to look very similar to any other. And it really is a tool for developers. I think anyone can use it. It's um, intuitive, but it's powerful, and with that comes a pretty complex interface. Um, It'll allow developers and designers to communicate, but not with the ease that some of the uh, not with the ease that some uh, with some of the examples we looked at earlier. So um, yeah, KSS and Storybook are both fantastic options to spin up a developer-friendly um, design system in record time. But those examples we looked at before, they're all custom builds. Um, there isn't really a tool that's going to pull all of that together for you. So my advice is, providing you've got the motivation, time, and budget, uh, build something from scratch. So yeah, what would that look like? Um, so this is like my wish list um, for a custom design system build. Um, the whole thing's powered by a static site generator. So we don't want to code 100 pages by hand. Um, there's tons of options with static site generators. Uh, so which one you choose um, will kind of depend on what you're doing um, with your front end stack internally. So I won't go into specific options. Um, documentation, I think they should be written in Markdown. Um, it's going to make it somewhat easy to contribute to. You could use Drupal as a content repository, and I'm sure some of the larger design systems do that. Um, but I think there's something to be said for keeping things um, lean and skilling up your team. So really, like anyone should be able to contribute to your docs by editing markdown files and pushing up pull requests. So yeah, you'll need to demo your components, and the static site generator can help there too. You can build uh, pages with templates that include component markup, for examples. Um, you can use a syntax highlighter with some JavaScript to spin your component markup out into code examples. Um, yeah, you could even get fancy and involve something like CodePen as well to bring them both together. And yeah, taking a step back, the overall design of the website um, should be based on the design system itself. So you'll have like a wealth of components um, and styles to draw from. So um, you just combine them all together into a clear design and um, should save um, some design work. So yeah, now that we've built the design system um, website and we've included all our documentation, what about the code that goes into it and how do we help others actually use it? So most design systems will feature a CSS and a JavaScript bundle for developers to include in their project. Um, combine that with the markup examples in the design system, and developers can build out components for themselves. Beyond that simple workflow, uh, the type of code will depend entirely on your organization's tooling. Um, you might be focused heavily on React, so it would certainly make sense that your design system includes React components. However, I'd argue that the most successful design systems don't dictate a technology, a specific technology choice. Using vanilla CSS and JavaScript means that anyone can take what you've built and use it inside any front end. Um, yeah, I think that's the beauty of getting back to the basics and speaking the language of the browser instead of some arbitrary framework. 
So you can also provide options. Um, so it's possible to support multiple CSS workflows by providing SAS, post CSS, and vanilla CSS import options. So here's an excerpt from the uh, Service New South Wales Style Guide. The accordion CSS gets installed with um, the npm command at the top. Um, we then provide the four different options for usage. So post-CSS is the preferred option. It's what we've used to build this style guide. The post-CSS um, ecosystem of plugins lets us use modern CSS features that um, haven't made their way into all browsers yet. Um, things like CSS variables and nesting and it transpiles them into a CSS syntax that is understood by all browsers. Then we have the SAS um, import through the use of iGlass. So iGlass is like a loader for SAS and it gives it compatibility with NPM. And finally, we have the two options for vanilla CSS, the at import and the link tag. So all four options are valid. Um, they provide a similar experience and the same CSS ends up in the browser. We could probably go one step further and add a fifth option that would show you how to bring that CSS into a JavaScript app. So using NPM to distribute our packages, can you guys see that at all? Yeah, it's, it's way out, hey? Didn't run the color contrast checker on that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, using NPM is what gives us this flexibility. So um, here's part of the package.json file for the accordion. So yeah, if you can see that, um, there is a style property and it's the original post.css file. So there's a plugin for post.css called post.css import and it allows an at import that uses the name of the NPM package to directly pull in this file. And moving down, this is the eyeglass section. So that's what provides the SAS import. The name specified here allows an at import to pull in this package. And then, yeah, we've got the script section. So um, this is where I'm running the post CSS command. It spits out a vanilla CSS file into a disk directory. And that's the file that gets used for the SAS import and the vanilla imports. So yeah, an accordion wouldn't be much good without any JavaScript. So for that, vanilla JavaScript is the obvious choice. Um, it can be used in any browser and inside any JavaScript framework. It's just pure JavaScript after all. So this example provides two options, uh, the ES6 import and the trusty script tag. So once the required JS, JS has been included, there's a one line example at the bottom there on how to initialize it. So this is the relevant section of the package JSON for the JavaScript. Uh, that is the main property. So it's what populates the ES6 import. Um, and for that, we're using the dist version of the JavaScript. The dist version is transpiled uh, using rollup and babel. So there's a CLI command there in the script section. And um, yeah, building JS like that is what gives you the best compatibility. So NPM really is the ideal way to distribute any front end libraries. It's likely that your front end will depend on other NPM packages. So why not just tap into the ecosystem when you come to distribute your code? And there's some pretty big benefits. This is the big one. So yeah, it can't really be understated how important version control is. And it's important for two main reasons. Um, Firstly, for consumers of your design system, being able to pin to a particular version will give them confidence that nothing's going to break on them. So the app that they've built will continue to work as is um, until they step in and manually upgrade something. NPM will keep all your 
past versions of any package as well, that too. So if they, if they need to roll back, um, if something's not working as expected, they can. And that surety um, is also what allows us as developers to change and improve things as we need to. We don't have to worry about breaking anything because our users um, will have their own test, places in pro uh, test pl processes in place and they can update things as they need to. So it's extremely liberating to be able to roll out a new major version um, of something without worrying about backwards compatibility, knowing that your users can upgrade in their own time. So uh, just a little primer on semantic versioning of Semver, um, which underpins NPM. So yeah, of any, a developer of any publicly available package, it's super important to be across um, these three numbers when you release code. So that's the patch version. You can update to a patch version with confidence that nothing's going to break. This is where bug fixes will be added. Um, and you pin to the patch version by using the tilde character. This is the minor version. So um, again, you can update to a minor version with confidence that nothing's going to break. Um, you'll get new features here, and you'll probably get some warnings about deprecations too. Um, however, all your existing code will continue working. And you can pin to minor versions by using the caret character. And yeah, this is the major version. So major version changes mean breaking changes. Um, you won't want NPM to automatically update to a major version, as that's where deprecated code is removed and new breaking features are added. And to update to a major version, you'll have to scale release notes and potentially rewrite a lot of your code. So there's a couple of downsides um, with NPM. I guess the most notable is the main NPM registry, npmjs.org, is uh, public. Um, when, for lots of reasons, you might want to keep your code private. Um, I'd probably argue against that, though. So firstly, your front-end code is all public anyway. When someone visits your website, um, it's really easy just to pull down all the front-end assets. Secondly, NPM will only publish what you tell it to. So it's possible to keep your secret source secret um, by only publishing compiled and minified assets. So only include the source codes um, when you publish if you want to. Uh, so yeah, using the public npmjs.org registry is by far the easiest option. Um, it's got the lowest barrier of entry uh, for developers coming onto your design system. Um, yeah, there is the option of private packages as well through an npmjs.org account or a private npm registry hosted through GitLab. Um, However, yeah, these options are just a little bit more complex and costly, certainly, um, and they will limit your flexibility somewhat. So yeah, how do we distribute with um, NPM? Your design system is likely to include uh, quite a few different components, some of which will be integral to every user, like typography and colors. Others, like the accordion, might be used less so. So instead of bundling everything up together and insisting that consumers of your design system include a huge asset bundle, uh, it makes sense to split components out into their own NPM packages. And the tool to do that is called Learner. So Learner works with NPM to help you keep your entire code base inside a single repository and push out individual components into their own NPM packages. That's what's called a mono repository. Um, it includes tools to manage dependencies, version control, and to publish packages. So yeah, this is what a mono repository looks like. This is the root directory. It includes all the repo-wide things like post CSS and rollup config, um, stuff that's going to be used by each package. It's got its own package.json, and you can include global um, dependencies for your project here. Inside the packages, packages directory, these are all the directories that Learner will publish. 
And yeah, inside a package, we've got the source code um, for each individual package. So the source code for this NPM package is going to be more than just JavaScript. There might be a common misconception with NPM. It's not just for JavaScript. You can distribute any code with NPM and iGlass and post CSS import are the are two tools we looked at to enable CSS integration with NPM. So yeah, we can have tests um, for each package can live here as well. So in this package, we're using Nightwatch to run functional tests on the accordion as well as um, Axe, which runs the automated accessibility tests. Um, they test for things like color contrast and ARIA roles and attributes. We've got the changelog markdown file. It's important to include that as well. So there's an easy way to automate the maintenance of this file, which I'll go into in a minute. And the readme should include instructions on how to install and use the package. And that file gets featured on the package's homepage on npmjs.org. And finally, the package.json file, which we looked at earlier on. Um, this configures the package on the NPM registry. It also contains package-specific build steps, which Learner will run before the package is published. So yeah, Learner itself is configured with a JSON file, which you can't read. Um, we specify the version um, at the top, so Learner's got its own versioning as well. So um, additionally, we can point it to a directory of packages. And it has versioning options. So that's, I'm using the independent versioning option. Um, that's what I'd recommend for a design system. It allows each package to have its own version and you can push out changes to one package um, without pushing out um, changes to your whole mono repository. And the last couple of options are some pro tips. So um, yeah, so learners got, uh, these are, this is the command section. So um, we can specify arguments here, which learner will run um, well, they'll get passed through automatically when you, when you run um, learner commands. So it's, there's a command called bootstrap, and it's what installs dependencies for each package. So I'm using the hoist option there. Um, this will hoist dependencies from the mono repository's root. Um, so yeah, these CLI commands are used to build, build each package. Um, on publish, we've got like Babel and Webpack and PostCSS. Um, each one's probably got like a dependency tree of you know several hundred dependencies. So hoisting will just symlink the binaries up into each package so you can run those um, build commands in, in the package directories and that will save you doubling up on you know thousands of dependencies in your mono repository. And yeah, that last line there um, tells learner to use conventional commits. So these will help learner um, version packages for you automatically, as well as generate a change log in each package. So conventional commits is a detailed specification to help machines understand your commit messages. Here's a quick breakdown of what one looks like. So this is the type. Um, there's a list of things you can do there. Um, the fix type. Um, tells learner to, um, to bump the patch version number. And you can use the feet uh, type to bump the um, minor version number. And you can also add an exclamation mark before the colon, and that will tell learner it's a breaking change, and that will bump the major version number. Then we've got the scope there. So that's really like an arbitrary description of some component um, inside the package. Um, here it concerns the print styles. And after a colon and a space, we have the summarized commit message. So um, you can include a bigger message as well after a line break. 
Um, and this is what gets added to the change log. So, yeah, the, oops, sorry. The final piece of the puzzle is to add these um, two dependencies in this piece of config to your mono repositories package.json. Um, Committers in, uh, which you can probably barely see, but it's a dependency which um, gives you an interactive wizard. So when you're committing, you can go through a wizard and just list what everything is. You can enter all your messages in, and it will um, write the structured message for you. And there's another um, dependency there called CZ conventional changelog, and it's, um, it will write the changelogs for you um, based on your commit messages. So all you need to do is just run this one command, learn a publish, and it will, um, providing your commit messages are written to spec, it will uh, version um, the packages for you, um, and only things that have changed. It will output an updated change log. It will run any build steps that you have in each individual package, and it also publishes your package to the NPM registry. So yeah, let's pull it all together and see what a finished product looks like. We've got the design system website. Um, it can be produced using KSS node storybook or if budget allows a custom static site generator. Documentation should be extensive and ideally written in Markdown and committed to the code base. And the design of the website can use existing components from the design system um, combined with a few bespoke elements to make a unique product. And yeah, code distribution should be handled with NPM, ideally via the public registry. Components in the design system should be split out logically into their own packages using Learner, and conventional commits are used to easily add semantic versioning to all your packages. Thanks, guys. I think we've got a bit of time for some questions, so... Far away. Anyone have any questions? Uh. Oh. Thanks for that. Uh, so, am I understand this correctly? You're using the same design system for all your client websites? We're working on one at the moment called Mixtape, which um, is is sort of we built two sites with it now. I think. Um, yeah, I think we've still got quite a lot to go on it to kind of expand it. Um, but that's, that's kind of the dream for us, I think. We've got this shared um, language, and Rich is going to go into this in his, his talk as well. Um, yeah, so we've got this shared language now that we're able to use for client sites, basically. Yeah. Thanks. Um, have you looked at the Storybook um, MDX format? Um, it's a recent addition to Storybook. Yeah, I'm not like I'm not a huge Storybook um, expert, really. I haven't delved into it too much. Yeah, I did a bit of discovery on it, um, really, just for the talk. And yeah, we're kind of probably evaluate it um, fully and yeah, see if we're going to use it in the near future. I think, but yeah. I guess the idea is to be able to put your stories within a, another site that you've designed. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Uh, front row. <clears throat> Thank you, very good. And uh, my question is, I see you uh, build components in uh, just plain JavaScript uh, without using the React and uh, uh, Vue.js. Um, so I think then we need to just uh, using the plain HTML template to use your component. Um, so in this way, um, can you share some like a downside uh, using vanilla JS or benefit you get in this way without using React and um, Vue.js? Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, so like a lot of design systems will provide, um, yeah, basically like multiple alternatives. So you could have a design system which has like a React version of a component, a Vue version of a component, a um, you know vanilla or whatever it is. You could just keep making them basically and you could have different 
files inside the design system and you know, just have instructions on how users can import each one in depending on their framework. Um, and you could have it all stored inside the same NPM package as well. So it could kind of the code could kind of leverage itself. Um, so we're doing that with a couple of components as well, like depending basically if it makes sense, we might include a React version as well. Um, but yeah, so the vanilla, like the vanilla JavaScript approach is kind of awesome because yeah, you, you only really need um, yeah, the HTML markup, as you said. So like as long as you've, you've got the right markup um, and all you need to do is just follow the code example in the, in the design system. Um, and you know, you need to initialize that JavaScript somehow. So like say you wanted to, like that accordion example, say you wanted to use that in React, where you just create a React, React component which replicated the markup and like on one of the component initializing cycles, just call that, um, that vanilla JavaScript and then it's kind of set up, ready to go. That way you're using the same, the same vanilla JavaScript to power the functionality of the accordion so you don't need to duplicate the functionality inside React, you know, with the component life cycles there. Um, yeah, the accordion's just a really simple open and close, so it kind of makes sense to do it like that. I guess like more complex components you would want to have React versions to get the extra functionality Re React gives you. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yes, that makes sense. Uh, so for from uh, a basic point, you have the HTML version first, and when we need, uh, we can add um, React or Vue.js support in because you have already split them into small packages, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But when we have very complicated component, it's just Sometimes, you, if you're just using HTML, you need a, a lot HTML and uh, put put all the data in the HTML yep. before running the JavaScript. In that case, we maybe need to think about the support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the uh, including like a React component is nice because you can get the you you don't have to work, at that point the people are implementing d the design system don't have to worry about the markup because you can just include that in your React component ready to go and they can just add a button in and they've got all the cl correct classes. Um, and yeah, you could even, like with the accordion, you could even have a React component um, that leverages the vanilla JS anyway that's got all the markup done, ready to go, yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, really helpful, thank you. Uh, with your design system, how do you handle the exceptions of when you have all your dis all your system already organized, show everything? But how can you handle all the exceptions or personalization of your design when it's not it's mainly for that client and it looks similar, it behaves similar, but it's some it, there's always something different or unique to your system, your design that you already built. Yeah, so yeah, um, there's a few, like there's a few different approaches there. Like I think the go-to approach is to use like a variable system where like we're using post-CSS variables for that. So um, there's like a post-CSS variables file which has got a whole bunch of things um, that we can tweak. We can tweak things like color and um, typography, spacing grid styles, that kind of stuff, just by inputting new variables. Um, and, you know, that file just gets included in that, um, that project. So that makes things slightly different. It's not mainly in terms of kind of um, colors and typography. It's within your structure of your design. Um, how do you handle those exceptions or uniqueness if you want to either keep it for that client or not to handle as a in yeah. your distribution package? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I kind of see that, like, you've got the design system as the underlying level there. So, depending on, like, how it's designed and what it looks like, it's got a lot of, like, assumed um, rules, and that's where, like, all the spacing and stuff comes in. And then you've got, like, then you've got that variable layer sort of in between, and then there's, like, the layer at the top, which is really just, like, for a Drupal site, it could just be the Drupal theme and it would have its own CSS on top of that. And 
yeah, designing it in a way that you can have, you know, that CSS at the top, um, not necessarily overriding things, but just kind of working on top to add like a new, you know, like a new customized design. I think that's quite possible. It's a bit of a tricky balance. You don't want to have to be like constantly overriding styles and changing things just because the design system specified in a way. I think it's key to, in this situation, when it's getting reused for um, you know, project sites and client sites, keep the design system as simple as possible. Don't be like overly prescriptive with the styles, just like get the, the base things in there that you need to. Allow customization as much as you can with variables and then yeah, build it so that you don't need to override stuff and you can add, you can add that extra layer of styles to personalize it. And you wouldn't necessarily use like all the components, I guess, like you just add in some new custom components as well. Like it's kind of like the one-off stuff I was talking about before. Like if you've got some design, the design system can kind of inform a lot of the site, but you might have like a completely customized hero and navigation and header and all that kind of stuff, you know, just to keep it unique for each client, yeah. Well, we've got a few minutes left if anyone has a burning question. <laughs> no, <Nah>, cool. <laughs> right. Thanks, guys.